Good afternoon. I'm Diana Lawson, the Dean of the Seidman College of Business, and I want to welcome you to the Seidman Seminar Series on the Impact of COVID-19 on West Michigan Businesses. Today's seminar will focus on understanding new economic realities. And before we start in that, I just want to give you, I want to suggest one thing. There's a book called Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. And I know many of you are making all sorts of decisions for dealing with the COVID impact and what the future is going to look like. In that book called Decisive, he looks at various frameworks. They look at various frameworks for making uh, different types of decisions. And there's one framework that's simple to remember, but is really useful. It's called 10, 10, 10. And all of the decisions you make as you are, are managing and leading your businesses uh, and dealing with, with employees and other things like that, think of 10, 10, 10. What will your decision feel like in 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years? It allows you to look at today as well as the future. So with that, let's look at what the future looks like uh, in terms of the economic, the new economic realities. We have uh, Paul Isley, Professor of Economics and Associate Dean in the Seidman College of Business, who will be our moderator, and he will introduce the three panelists. And thank you, panelists, for being with us today. Hope you all enjoy the seminar, uh, webinar. Paul? Excellent. Thank you, Diana. All right. So I'm just going to do some quick introductions here since uh, you were all able to see uh, their bios running online beforehand. Uh, but uh, our three panelists are, are Jim Roby, who is the Director of Regional Economic Planning Services at the Upjohn Institute at, uh, in Kalamazoo. Uh, you, if you're into trying to follow the economy, you uh, likely make a pilgrimage in December to watch him uh, prognosticate about what the year is going to look like. So uh, he has a lot of, of chops for that. We have uh, Chris Spaulding, who is owner and president of Brewery Vivant. Uh, uh, she has been part of building uh, that company into part of what has made uh, Grand Rapids Beer City and, uh, and is directly in the front lines of what's going on right now. Uh, and we have uh, Dave Riley, who is VP of Business Intelligence and Research at The Right Place. Uh, and if you deal with these types of issues uh, and there's data involved, there's a good chance that Dave's in the room with you. So uh, I think we have three really good people here to help us sort of get a grasp of where things are, are looking and where they're heading. Uh, so I'm just going to take two seconds here and note and just sort of set up where we're at. Um, April has been uh, a stunning month by economic numbers, uh, maybe a disastrous month. Uh, we saw unemployment claims in Michigan reach levels that we've never seen, uh, as well as across the United States. Uh, we saw personal income drop already the month before April, uh, and we saw consumers start to hunker down even before we had stay-at-home orders. Uh, this has created a very challenging business environment uh, that we have to operate in as we try to get restarted. All right, so I'm going to start by giving each of uh, the panelists uh, a few minutes to, to tell us about what they're seeing right now. And I think we should start with Jim, since you have a good overview of where the economy is at. <clears throat> Paul, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I think maybe the most important thing to think about is this is, and I, I hate the hyperbole of the media, but this is unprecedented. As we've gone in and out of other recessions, and there is a lot of question about whether we're in a recession, certainly the Wall Street Journal called it yesterday. We've not heard from NBER, but uh, <clears throat> it is likely that we are in a recession. Our partners at the University of Michigan have looked at the next two quarters for negative growth, but then a strong rebound. I've seen in the media recently, even though we have 30 million cumulative claims uh, coming across uh, the U.S., that many re people refer to these as lost jobs, but in particular, looking at the war notices, the workforce uh, notices that are put out for large mass scalings, they're primarily temporary losses. Um, but what that going back to work looks like is sort of new for us. So we've been talking with the construction people pretty closely. They're looking at staggered starts. We know that most construction folks like to start at five and leave at three. But 
what will this look like in construction, in manufacturing, in office where you're social distancing? It's really an unknown going forward. Also, if you look at the data, uh, also coming from University of Michigan, they've estimated that most people collecting unemployment are pretty close to that max number, which is $962 in the state of Michigan. So part of the question will be, are people willing to go back to work? So there are kind of three structural questions to this. One is, if people will people go back to work, are there jobs? Two, are they willing to go back in the environment working multiple shifts and others? Uh, could be an issue and then where will fear come into going back to work i think additionally some of the issues that we need to think about are around supply chain and we've seen um, the supply chain in theory from china starting to come back but we are also looking at issues of moving goods uh, ship orders are down globally, but uh, all the major cargo carriers today came out and said, no, it's all going to be good again. Um, and then when we look at reshoring, there's some a large discussion from Ford and others about strategic reshoring in pharma, in auto parts, in medical devices, and other critical path uh, sorts of things in the Site Selectors Guild, which is sort of one that Dave and I look at a great deal. They are kind of the group of folks who talk about site selection, uh, both on the site selection side and on the major corporate side. And 85% of their people think they'll be strategic reshoring of supply chains, at least into North America. So if you can't get it here by boat or by plane, which we know to be a problem now, you can get it here by, uh, by truck. Uh, so really, as we look at this, some of the great limiting factors, particularly for West Michigan, are a lack of buildings, how workforce will be involved in this, and, and, and Paul and, and, and the dean, I mean, you know, the, the questions of higher education, both at the two-year and four-year, how will training work, and all those sorts of things. So everybody's expecting a big rebound, and I think that's correct, but where and how that plays out is that Two months from now, we see the, the protest in Lansing without being political. We, is it six months from now? Is it a year from now? And I think that's really the question. The reality is going into this on March 5th when I gave two outlook talks, the fundamentals of the economy were absolutely solid and COVID was maybe affecting supply chains. Two weeks later, we're at home. We don't know kind of going to the Dean's thing 10 days from now, 10 months from now and 10 years from now, what this is gonna look like. But it's an interesting time for people like Paul and me to look back uh, in the future. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I'm being reminded that uh, for those of you who are watching uh, that as the panelists uh, walk through this first part, uh, if you end up with some questions, uh, please use your Q&A feature at the bottom. It's normally at the bottom, but in some browsers it's in the top, just to make it complicated. It'll say Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, please put it there and we will see and try and get to as many questions as we can as we move through this hour. All right. So I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on to, to Chris Spaulding next. So, so Jim gave us sort of this bigger overview. Uh, uh, Chris is a business owner dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's see where that's at. It is an interesting time. Um, just a, a few points I wanted to make. First, you know, the, the general feel in the brewery and restaurant industry. Um, as a brewery, we have a good thing in that we can sell our beer in uh, stores as well as selling direct to consumers. Um, I think that's worked out better for some breweries uh, more than others. Anyone who has a, a 12 pack or a 15 pack is seeing a, a nice increase in their sales, uh, especially from chains. Um, but if you're like us and you don't have a lot of quantity um, packaging like that, you're realizing that, well, that would have been a good thing to have in place at this point and the nature of our business it's not an easy quick pivot to get to a, a package that size it takes quite an investment so um, that's been an interesting thing to watch uh, in the industry in total um, as far as the restaurant side um, you know we, we've been able to do the takeout curbside pickup delivery model um, with our two pubs uh, it's it's evolved a little bit over time um, but that's really uh, for us it's enough to pay for the people that wanted to continue working 
um, and their benefits and then um, food costs. But beyond that, it's not really adding to the bottom line of the company. Um, it's not helping us pay rent or anything like that. So I think we're in a, a position that's quite similar to um, a lot of our peers uh, where you're doing it because you want to stay connected to the community and you want to still offer, you know, some amount of experience um, that you can because that's why people like to support restaurants and breweries um, is that experience piece. Um, so that's, that's been, uh, you know, it, it's helpful for sure, but it's definitely not paying the bills. <laughs> uh, we're down about 80% just as a reference point. Um, and I think, you know, that also looks different from one place to another, depending on your menu and how that all looks. Um, one bright side of that is a lot of customers are buying um, direct from us as far as our beer. And that's how we make, you know, the most money off of our product is direct sale as uh, so we're not having to pay a share to everyone else. Um, so that's been something we've been trying to increase anyway. It's been good to see um, that just happening naturally. Um, it is sad though, if I go look in our cooler and there's just a sea of kegs, um, you know, no one can really sell draft beer right now. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the industry about, you know, what's gonna happen to all of this beer that will quote unquote be dead by the time um, we're allowed to reopen. Uh, so we have some uh, things we're working on related to that, but I, I think that'll be a, an interesting challenge and it, not to go down a, a rabbit hole, but, you know, if people are dumping beer, that can be a challenge to the wastewater treatment plant. So I, I hope that there's some kind of coordinated effort there if there is a, a need to do some mass dumping. A um, couple other things I just want to mention. I think we're going to talk about the relief programs later, so maybe I'll hold off my comments there, but it, the gist of my comment would be the hospitality industry is, is definitely not um, the right industry for the packages that have been available. Um, so I can talk about that more um, later. You know, we're, we're doing what we can to, to make our own situation work. Um, as far as the reopen question and, and where staff uh, mindset is, I haven't heard from any of my staff that they don't want to work until um, you know, July 31st when the additional $600 in unemployment runs out. I think our staff uh, that want to come back are like itching to come back and miss feeling that connection with others and feeling like they're, you know, doing something beyond uh, just sitting at home playing video games, which I think most of them are doing. Um, but we do have about 50% of them, um, when I, I survey them to see where they're at, that are very concerned about their health uh, when we are allowed to reopen and would prefer us to not reopen the day we can, but reopen when we all collectively feel like it's safe for them and for our customers. Um, there's a lot of concern about, you know, dirty dishes. I don't want to touch dirty dishes right now, or I don't want to have close interaction with customers, uh, which in a service model is, is an interesting challenge, right? Um, there's definitely will be like restaurants will look different. I think everyone can assume that's the case um, for the short term and who knows how long that'll last. Um, but that means different roles. So if you're coming back, are you willing to come back in a different capacity than you were um, prior? So there's a lot of questions that we're asking um, and getting some good feedback from our team. Um, the last thing I'd like to say, or maybe two couple quick things, uh, Something that I like to see is that as a company that works a lot with our local supply chain, uh, we've been able to do some cool things with partnerships that wouldn't have come up if we didn't work with local purveyors. Um, so a shout out to anyone purchasing locally because I think you can get more creative, whether that's us selling their product direct to customers as more of a grocery or um, some of our meat sellers that we have contracts with are able to sell direct to um, residences right now for the meat we had contracted. So those are really cool things to um, to see the benefits of, of local purchasing. And the last thing I would just say is, you know, emotionally, uh, this is a really hard time. Um, that first week where we were, you know, forced to close the week of um, St. Patrick's Day, thankfully my mother-in-law came and watched our kids because you can imagine the emotions going through a house that's run by a couple <laughs> that has this business that, um, you know, our family relies on and we don't have a, a second income coming in, right? It's all this business. So 
uh, that has been an, a, a challenge and we've We've been able to navigate it, Jason and I, where if one of us is in a bad place that day, we just try not to talk to the other one about work because uh, we're not going to be helpful. Um, but when we're both in a more optimistic mindset, you know, that's when we can have conversations about what does a pivot look like and what types of things do we think we can be doing to innovate and get through this time. So it's like an emotional roller coaster for sure. And I'm sorry that I have kids that have to deal with that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Chris. I think that, that that's extremely enlightening to start to get a feel for how the, the workforce is perceiving this as, as many of us are, are, are handling this from uh, positions where we're uh, maybe more insulated from those day-to-day -day, uh, uh, interactions with workers who have to interact with people. So I think that's really important to help us understand how this might move forward. So understand uh, a little bit about the support structure that's out there. I think uh, we'll kick over to Dave and then we'll be moving to a few questions and then be pulling in questions from the rest of the audience. So, uh, Dave. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity here to talk and to learn from everybody. Um, so real quick, just so the right place is a regional economic development organization. We're a nonprofit funded by private and public um, entities. And our main focus is to, to focus on uh, manufacturing companies, tech companies, health science, and food and beverage processing companies uh, like, like Brew Devant, for example. And what we're trying to do is help them overcome barriers to growth, right? So that's our main value proposition. And that, that has not um, changed. And the way that we do that is through, you know, three decades of relationship building with private business leaders as well as municipal leaders to help them overcome so that our residents here in the region can have quality jobs and that there can be prosperity to be shared. Um, and so, you know, we've talked a lot as an entity is like, does, does this reality change anything? And, and it doesn't, right? Our, our main focus is how do we, you know, it's not just removing barriers to grow businesses, but how do we help retain and grow, uh, retain, the, retain the employers that are here and help them overcome the barriers that they're facing. Um, but yeah, it, it is really all focused on relationships. And um, so when this happened, you know, our office closed, um, the same week that restaurants and bars, at least we started working remotely, I should say. And, um, you know, I, I used to work, have a background in insurance claims, and this is like the hurricane hit and in the entire economy, uh, but there's no physical damage. It's affecting every city, every state, every region, um, every nation for that matter, right? And so as Jim mentioned, it sounds kind of like hyperbole, but some of you, but it's truly unprecedented and it is affecting every single person, right? And for even the, the companies and that organizations that have seen an increase in volume as they respond to the crisis, this is also unprecedented. Um, so really what, you know, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is just how um, we've responded to that crisis because it is truly crisis response mode within the organization. So we have board members and investors, uh, members of our organization across all industries and including healthcare systems. And so we were pulled into conversations very early, uh, right, you know, uh, a little bit before mid-March uh, as they were identifying the urgent and critical need for increase in availability of high quality protect, uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, as I know, I'm sure most people know that acronym these days. Um, so uh, a handful of our team, um, I should say the majority of our business development team has really been really focused on acting as a conduit between local manufacturers and companies in the region who are able to either procure or produce personal protective equipment, and then also helping connect those, them to the organizations and entities that are in, in desperate need for more and to increase their supply. So we have had a team about uh, five or six of our team have, who have been nosed down for over a month and a half working on that. Um, it's really a wonderful testament to the business community and our collaborative nature. I know that's something I've heard for the last six years. I've worked at the right place as that there's something unique in the region around collaboration. And really, this is one of you know, what it really came to light to see this happening. You know, employers reaching out, manufacturers asking how they can pivot, pivot how they can support you know, that employers that might have a bunch of PPE sitting in a supply room somewhere that they don't actually need because they're not open. Uh, responding and facilitating. Um, and also it talks about the strength of our regional manufacturers who are, um, are working to, to produce products maybe they hadn't before to either retool. Um, the state's made available some grant dollars to help with that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's really 
unprecedented times. And so we're, we're managing that response. We're also um, working on the conversation, you know, what we've already touched on is the, um, the reopening. And where, where we see what we're working on is helping to make sure we're providing the best practices and standards uh, to our small and medium-sized companies that are in the area, particularly in the tradable sectors. So again, like the manufacturing, food and beverage processing, um, medical device type companies, uh, because you know a lot of them don't necessarily have the capacity to build these plans out th themselves, right? So we're working to gather the best practices from large international manufacturing companies, such as Lear or Magna, um, uh, just as two examples, and then sharing them with, with our relationships that we have from the companies that fund us, the various councils that we convene, uh, so that they can, they can formulate and they can continue, you know, as things begin to reopen, they can make sure that their customers and their employees are really protected as best as possible and they're, they're taking all the steps they need. Um, on that note, I think one thing that's really important to think about is as we start to work towards reopening, um, you know, it, it, the, the way that this happens is incredibly critical. And um, it's less about industries and specific types of businesses and much more around how businesses operate, right? For example, that's one way that we've talked a lot about it is that this is gonna take, it's based off your establishment versus just your industry, right? It's not all just transferable. Um, so every business establishment is gonna need, you know, might have similarities with a competitor or a peer uh, business, but you know, they're gonna have to look at their, the way that they conduct business and operate and how they uh, provide their value proposition. And that will depend on most of it. So. Um, it's going to be, you know, the barriers are really high um, as far as reopening because we just never, no one's ever done this before. And um, Paul, you've said this to me several times when I've talked to you over the last month and a half, you know, can't control the virus. Um, and that is the, the, by far the most challenging and vexing part of this whole problem that we're working to solve. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I look forward to, to hearing some questions and continuing the conversation. So thanks a lot. I have to get to, uh, to unmute. Um, so, yeah, I wish I was back in the world where I didn't know where PPE was. Uh, so uh, that, that, that was a fond memory from just a month and a half ago. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of, of, of starter questions and, and they're dovetailing nicely with some of the questions that are already starting to show in. Uh, but I definitely want to go where, where Chris was alluding before, which is, which is how effective have, have the uh, stimulus programs been that we're seeing and, and are, are we able to take advantage of these in a way that, uh, that's gonna help us get out of this process faster. So I think I'm gonna let Dave start with that because I think Dave may have a view from the economic development stand and then I'm gonna run to Chris. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's, the first few weeks um, as things began to lock down and then also programs became uh, formula began formulating and also becoming available. It was, yeah, it was a lot to try to maintain and, and keep track of. Um, so yeah, it, and I think, you know, they'll start, start with Chris's point around the hospitality sector. Um, so the state of Michigan made available when they first mandated that restaurants, bars, salons um, and the like close before the stay home, stay safe order came through, the state put together a $10 million fund to help those businesses that were forced to close. Um, and the right place uh, was the entity in Kent County that could apply for that based off the program. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was really, um, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, it's being pushed very quickly. We're trying to get the dollars out, but it's really been an eye-opening experience for me personally and as, as an organization around uh, for one, uh, just the vulnerability of some of the small businesses um, that they have and the, the need, the, the, the need is just so, so high. And there's just unfortunately no way that for one, the $10 million across the state is going to be able to cover it, let alone some of the other um, programs that are out there. But, you know, the, it, it's, it's a real challenge when um, the, the volume is so high. We had over 2,000 applications requesting somewhere around $15 million just for Kent County in this, this space. Uh, and we had it for Kent County, $615,000 to work to reward. So there, there's a review committee that's been working through that. You know, one of the main goals is just trying to, for one, award the dollars because they're available to the best businesses based off applications and things. Um, while at the same time, working through that process so that we can work towards the next program that's available, right? This is a, kind of that first tier that came through. And now we're, we're working in, in, um, with that next tier and the, the, the payroll protection program, the PPP, 
not PPE, um, obviously is came to light as one of the main uh, programs for any business who has a payroll uh, to, to pursue. And that was through the SBA. Um, so they had to go through their commercial bankers for that, which is also, a, again, from my six years working at the right place was a very different process because usually if a business needed to go through a, some sort of program, it would go through a municipality or um, you know the right place could help connect and inform uh, how they, I'll fill out those applications. But this is very much like you need to talk to your banker, you need to get in line. Um, and, and get you know get your application in. Um, and again, from the conversations we've had with commercial bankers in the area, like the volume again incredibly high. And we all saw that right that the funds were depleted within two weeks, and they had to re uh, put another several hundred billion of dollars into it. Um, so again, I think it's it, you know the programs are coming out. I think the the thing that's I'm I'm eager to see is kind of once the crisis you know, hopefully we'll begin to, we'll get past that crisis response mode and into actual stabilization and working to recover is what, what programs do come to light that are long-term sustainable as far as um, helping these businesses reopen um, and hopefully maintain payroll and keep the quality jobs in the region. But yeah, it's, it's unprecedented times and it's, it's, we wish that we, you know, that everybody could have access to support and funds to maintain and keep the, the jobs here in the region. And it's really, really hard and really, tragic and sad when you realize like that just can't be met while at the same time knowing that there are um some employers who are gonna you know a majority of employers will weather the storm you know uh, i was talking to a friend who um uh, looks at kind of the publicly traded companies more and you know assessing that and, and the things that he's hearing is that you know if there needed to be a full shutdown of the economy maybe this was not the worst time given the strength of our economy that you know some employers and the lessons learned from the 08-09 recession, they were, their balance statements were maybe in better shape than in the past. So maybe there's a good, a higher chance than than previously that they can weather these storms. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's a challenging time right now, especially as it relates to trying to get support and dollars into people's pockets. Um, so we, we hope that we can find uh, more programs and more funding to help float both households and firms um, through this as best we can. Okay. So Chris, uh, can you can you sort of dial that in to, to the individual experience as opposed to that broader broader view? Yeah, individually, it, it's a challenge just figuring out what all the programs are that are available and what makes the most sense um, for you know your specific business. We're lucky that we have a, a great partner in our bank, and our accountant is also um, very in tune to all this information. So helping pass a lot of information our way um, to make better decisions. Um, that said, you're still like, you're having to look into a crystal ball and assume you know what the future is going to be um, looking like for, you, for when you can open again or when you can be at full capacity or however it may be. Um, so we applied for uh, the PPP. You're, you know, one of the first our bank um, worked through that process with, and we got it, and we ended up turning it down, um, mostly because there's, you know, stipulations in there. It, it's a great program, I think, for some businesses, but you need to uh, pay the loan portion back within two years, and you are expected to be at full capacity with employees um, by June 30, which we thought was impossible, just given how our state has been um, reacting and the the way our numbers are going as far as COVID. So um, we know we couldn't, like if we had to dip into the loan part, like paying that amount back within a two year time span, while we aren't at full capacity, it would be impossible. So um, better to let someone else get that money. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, what, what's the thing that's gonna work for us? Um, thankfully, we were given a good amount of information about the employee retention tax credit, which I think is unfortunate. I'm not hearing as many organizations talk about. Um, when we work through um, those numbers, that actually allows for a longer opening period, um, a longer stretch of time through the end of the year where you see some financial um, assistance and some forgiveness of, of federal dollars. So. At this point, we're planning on doing that, though we haven't yet um, sent our information in for Q1 in case something changes and PPP is brought on a third time and with different terms. Um, but you can, you know, maybe you can hear it in my voice, right? Like trying to navigate unknowns and new systems that I think 
you know, all the help that's out there and all the relief that's being offered is um, amazing. And I welcome, you know, the fact that I appreciate very much that, that these things are, are available. Um, but I think maybe in scrambling to offer things uh, to all the people in a peanut butter type of spread of a situation, um, they're not necessarily as helpful for some types of businesses than others. Um, the other one that I think is mentioned a lot is the economic um, injury disaster loans, uh, which that seemed really promising as well um, until it came back and said the max any business can get is $15,000. Um, so if you're a business our size, you know, that that does really nothing. Um, so we, I think we received it or we um, were accepted, but we passed on that one too, is that that 15,000 isn't going to keep my business open, but it could keep a coffee shop open or a smaller business. So we're trying to make decisions that are um, good in the long term, um, but also understanding, you know, the the short term scenario is getting scarier. Um, but again, you know, props to my banker who's um, allowing us to defer our mortgage payments and um, our other loans that we have with them. Um, the SBA is paying, I believe, everybody's SBA notes for six months. So that's a huge um, relief for anyone that has an SBA loan. Um, so there's, you know, there, I think there's such a great intent and a lot of really good programs. Um, but the speed of all of that and the amount of input they had um, doesn't necessarily translate to being as effective as I think the intent was, from my perspective. That's very enlightening, especially since we're, 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 we're pumping two to three trillion dollars into the U.S. economy through the government to try and, and keep things going. It's, it's important that we get those to, in the hands of people who can actually turn those into jobs going forward. So, so Jim, how, how are you hearing about uh, these programs? Are they, are they being effective, number one? And number two, uh, our, uh, our audience is wondering, uh, when we get six months down the road, uh, how do we pay for all this? Because it's a lot of money that we're kicking out here. Well, Paul, I think you raised a really good question. I probably don't have anywhere near as good a handle as Dave and Chris on, on what firms are doing, but Certainly they do need that, but that two, three, four trillion dollars that we'll be looking at over the long run has certain implications as we try to pay that back. Um, my guess is, is that this is not the first or last pandemic that we'll see. And so um, I'm wondering how my children and grandchildren will be paying for this uh, over the time period and what sort of drag that makes on the economy in the long run. Uh, we've not modeled it yet. And I think it depends on uh, things that I've heard you also say, is this a B, a W, a U, or what does this look like? Uh, and so where do we really need to go to stabilize businesses that Dave's working with or businesses like Chris? Uh, so do we do come back in a very strong way, but then the implications in the long run with already $20 trillion uh, in debt plus another two, three, four trillion dollars at something like, what is it, 116% of GDP? Um, so it really is a scary time to think about going forward and hoping that we can grow our way out of this rather than seeing some sort of drag on the long run economy. Because talk, talk to me for just a second. This is different than the last time around with TARP, where in the end, a good chunk of that TARP money got paid back to the government. So they, they provided that support and that got paid back. A lot of this is, is, is a lot of this in that same light or is a lot of this money that's going to go out and not come back? Well, I, I'm not all that familiar with some of it, but you know, they talked about taking shares of airlines and other things much like they did with GM and that makes sense. But then you really don't want the government showing business how to run business. You want them to do their thing and, and pay them back. And I think the reality is, is that if people can stay whole in small businesses, uh, it, small and medium-sized businesses can weather this storm and come back. I think that's going to be the most important thing to see that growth because going into this, we were at three points, you know, a, a month and a half ago, 3.6% unemployment, 30, uh, 63 plus percent labor force participation rates, auto sales at 17 million. What was it? 13 or 12 that just came out on an annualized basis that the fundamentals were very strong. The question is how fast can we get back to that? How fast can we get back to people 
paying into the system through their tax structure rather than having to be supported uh, in, in bridge ways to just survive this. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think we need to sort of look at and explore this, this V, U, L thing. I think many economists are moving away from the thought process of a V uh, where we where we have a quick downturn and come right back. And I think part of that is the stress we've seen on small businesses. Uh, one of the local chambers uh, 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 questioned their, their uh, membership and 20% of them came back saying that they wouldn't survive if the stay at home existed to the end of, the, of May. All right. So given that depth of, of, of problems, how do we see summer? Do we see summer where we start to see a build? Um, or is that drag of those businesses closing and that fear of the virus going to hold us back? So I can go with all three of you on that one. Um, I'm going to start with Chris because we just been with Jim. <laughs> I don't even know what to expect for summer. We're planning on... Um, you know, maybe we'll be allowed to open by July 1 or August 1 or September 1. We're kind of looking at all the scenarios. So uh, your guess is as good as mine as far as how that looks. Um, you know, it's a scary thought, but the last thing I want to do is, is open too soon and create more issues and put my staff and my guests at risk. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, that uncertainty makes it hard to invest in the future. So, so over the last few years, you, you've expanded, you've gone into, you know, you've added in uh, broadly, if you've done things like that and, and added jobs to the economy. Um, how does this change and uh, change your ability and your thought processes? Just, yeah. Um, just not having any income right now. Right. Well, uh, one of the, one of the worst things as an employer is, you know, as I survey our staff to see um, who who's ready to come back when and that whole thing, right? Like, I, I want all of them to come back and I know they are not all going to be able to come back by our needs. Like, there's no way we can pay our staff of 75 if we're forced to be at 25% of our capacity or 50% of our capacity. Um, those numbers just don't work. Um, so it's kind of like the right place having to decide who gets to get these grants and loans. You know, how do you make those decisions when you understand all the individuals that you're, you're working with? So um, I assume everyone, you know, again, in the industry is in, in the same boat. And if you look at, you know, how does that trickle within the economy, right? If, if restaurants and the hospitality industry, which is such a big percentage is, at 50% of our employment or 75% even, um, you know, that means there's that many people that are still unemployed that aren't able to spend money. And June or July uh, 31st is going to come pretty quick for <laughs> everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to um, get through it, right? There's still, I mean, I think there's a question of, you know, if, if things do drag out longer, you know, we don't have a pile of money in the bank to pull us through. It, it's a matter of having these partnerships that I've alluded to a few times that are going to be what the difference is. So um, investing into the future is, is an interesting concept. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that's, that's going to be one of those drags that we see on the economy because as in economics, we know that, that what really causes that back end on the tail of a recession often is businesses' reluctance to re-engage re in that investment, either because they don't have the capital, uh, don't have the information, uh, or they just chose them not to at that point. So, so as we've, you know, as, as Chris has sort of helped us walk through that and now start processes for, for the restaurant industry, which is certainly one of the ones that has been strongly affected here. We have other industries across West Michigan that are, that are also being affected. Uh, and one that comes to mind is before we were Beer City, we were, we were a furniture city. Um, so, so, so Dave or Jim, um, and I'm okay if you both want to sort of tag team, uh, you know, what are we seeing on office furniture in the midterm here as a result of all this? Is, is this and, and what's sort of the longer term prospect there? <laughs> 
I, I can start, but yeah, I, I definitely won't, won't, won't try to present any expert level insights on that, to be honest. Uh, the main thing um, that, you know, your scenes, I think it's, it's been in the press pretty well, you know, one of the uh, steel case really pivoted to, to serve a need around the PPE production. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's, that helps both for the need because the demand is, is real and it's, it's scary and it's wonderful to see businesses pivoting that way. And, you know, that's just one example of, of hundreds of manufacturers in the area who have done some, some similar work. Um, but, you know, they're also trying to figure out how do they, you know, kind of to, to Chris's point, how do they find partnerships to innovate and pivot, even if it's kind of temporarily to, to have some level of revenue coming through the door so that they can try to try to weather this as best they can. So, um, and, and obviously, you know, the commercial real estate, you know, that, that, you know, office spaces will be fundamentally disrupted forever, I would imagine, because of this pandemic. Um, you know, every organization it doesn't, and it's not just, um, you know, office buildings, but even just, you know, any employer who has on-premises requirements for either their customers or their, their, co their workers, their employees is going to have to rethink about how their, their office and their workplace and their establishment is set up. And so, you know, that both has, you know, the, the disruptions, you know, create opportunities, but they also create um, destruction at times. So, you know, it'll be really fascinating to see. And the biggest thing is, you, again, we just don't know when we're really going to come out of this or how quick, you know, you don't want these big organizations to start um, pivoting too fast and, and really changing their strategy, right? Like, because we just don't know enough. It's extremely uncertain and um, really challenging. But um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be based off of the strong partnerships that they have where they can pivot and try to get some Kind of revenue and keep their workers working um, through through at least this crisis until we kind of get a sense of what the reopening plan looks like, um, and that's what obviously that's based off the public health stabilization. Um, so, so, so you're getting a sense that 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 we're still sort of in crisis mode and not starting to think about uh, how we're going to innovate our way out of this. Um, that we just don't have enough information. Is that is that what you're sort of sensing as you're interacting with businesses? Uh, you know, I, th I think it, it, it varies widely. Um, you know, I know uh, I've been contacted by a couple um, companies in the area um, who are doing like taking this moment because, maybe, you know, they might not be pivoting like um, into PPE production, but they're taking this to say, okay, how do we continue to capitalize on our existing st strategy, right? Uh, so one of the things I, I provide my team and I at the right place for the, is business intelligence. Um, so helping them, you know, they were asking a lot of different questions around specific industries in our sector that, you know, they weren't overly focused with the impact of COVID. They know it's going to disrupt and it's going to slow things down and things, they still were strategizing on how do they um, continue to build their business um, and, and find new clients and find new opportunities um, despite the disruption. So it really, I think, varies widely. Uh, right now, you know, just in our world, because we're an economic development organization and the economy is utterly in chaos still in at least stopped uh it still very much at times feels you know like crisis mode that's definitely probably just my personal experience coming through there but i, I think it really w varies widely across the, the board um you know companies are still planning to do internships our strategic partner hello west michigan is still putting on an intern connect event you know obviously it's not in person and they're changing um they're they're working with employers to say like you can still onboard you can still go through hiring processes if you can uh, and they're and giving them best practices on how to navigate that. Um, they had a membership uh, meeting just yesterday that I sat on for a bit and they were having a couple of the larger corporations, HR company uh, departments share their best practices on how they do virtual interviews and uh, business recruitment in this time, what that actually looks like. So, you know, there is business happening. Uh, you know, to be honest, today I've got a, a big deadline for a, a large uh, business attraction RFI for a manufacturing company that's still looking to make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in investment somewhere in the Midwest. So there's these realities that, you know, there are still strategic decisions being made and they know this is a crisis is happening, but it's not upending the world because again, it's that firm shut off of the economy. It's an intentional shut off and that it can be, you know, open back up in a measured way. So I think there's still some strong cautious, cautious optimism. There's also a lot of, lots of opportunity for companies, especially the tech sector in our area, which, you know, by job count may not be that large, but they're extremely strong businesses and, and organizations here, then they, one of the areas that we really specialize in is the cloud, um, managing the cloud, helping existing businesses transition to the cloud. So if you were a business and you had a server on site and you had just got shut down, you just realized I should have moved to the cloud earlier. 
or you will be moving shortly. Uh, so, you know, that creates opportunities there. Cybersecurity, obviously, um, that, you know, this moving to cloud creates need for increased cybersecurity. So there's lots of different ways where businesses are, are planning for an increase um, in volume and there is some levels of business as normal. So it, it, it definitely wi varies widely, but. Okay, so, so Jim, it sounds like there's, there's some things happening there. Um, so one of the things that, that Upjohn has done a lot of research on is, is how labor is having to react to, to the changes that were happening that I think that this is going to speed up. Um, so, so do you have anything to say with how workers are gonna have to start adjusting to, to what's going to be happening as we go through summer? Boy, Paul, I think you asked a really good question there. I think as we look at this kind of prior to the, the situation, there was something like 0.7 workers for every job opening. Um, that's quite likely to invert. And part of what we had focused on, at least I had in my first part was uh, supply chain. And I think what you've heard from Chris and Dave is about where demand's gonna be. So it's unclear what the demand for workers will be. Uh, we have talked about reshoring. So as you bring people back in and other things, and in a COVID, post-COVID environment, will we need to maybe have more automation? Will new projects, and we learned this a lot from our work at the right place, will newer projects have fewer workers in it? Um, will we need to, how will we overcome some of the staggered schedules and so some of the traditional barriers to entry for workers? Our childcare, which is usually kind of eight in the morning till six at night. What about transportation, particularly public transportation? We've seen cutbacks there. So as people try to work staggered shifts, as we think about how capital is used in manufacturing and you try to space people out, will you maybe instead of having one shift, have two shifts, will the workers be able to adapt to that? And again, carefully saying this, I think most people wanna go back to work, but if you can make more, and I've seen significant media coverage on this, more at home collecting the full unemployment, what's the implication for going back? And then somehow if government decides, well, you've turned down a job, you're no longer eligible in this environment, how cold is that? So I think that there's a lot of things going on in looking at what the world of work looks like going forward from capacity to how workers uh, participate and how new investment occurs probably with more skilled workers, particularly those coming out of places like community colleges, trade schools, uh, and apprenticeships. Right. Um, I think we have a couple of questions left here so that, uh, before we uh, sort of move to the, uh, towards the uh, close. Uh, and, and this is a, uh, a question specifically for Chris. So the, uh, the uh, viewer asks, uh, how can we help make things easier for restaurants while helping them keep their workers safe while preparing and delivering food and beer? Uh, so in the current scenario of um, takeout and delivery, right? Like just ordering food is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a lot of us are doing contactless, so uh, just abiding by, you know, the uh, requests that we have as far as if you're coming to pick your food up and our protocol says call and we'll bring it out to a, you know, table in between the two of us and then you get it, like allow us to do that instead of trying to come into the doors and, um, and not abide by the, uh, the rules of each establishment. Um, something we are looking at doing, uh, alluding to something Dave was talking about earlier, you know, the collaboration among um, businesses within our area is a pretty awesome thing. Um, and there, there is work that's being done behind the scenes um, between restaurants and breweries. Um, well, that will be starting to be done. So we can offer guests a similar look once we are reopen of here's what's expected and maybe even the same signage and some things like that. So as a customer, you're not guessing every time you go to a different restaurant what the protocol is. Um, I think that's a great idea and I think that would be very helpful to everybody. Um, that said, you know, one of the things that doesn't keep me up at night, but I definitely think about quite a bit is how like we'll be required, we are required this at, at this point already to do the health check with our staff every day, the ones that are still working, right? Like what's their temperature? Are they feeling well and all of that? 
Um, and that I think it will be easy for employees to take on. Um, what'll happen if any retailer or restaurant you go to wants you to do that before you can enter their doors and how are customers going to respond to that? Um, I think to answer the question um, related to that is just to be open to doing things that might feel awkward at first, but know that the intent is to keep everybody's safety top of mind. Um, you know, if, if all the restaurants around here say, hey, you're gonna have to just let us take your temperature or bring your own thermometer and show us that you're okay before you can come in the doors. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but if that's a request that people have, you know, I could see that looking like Facebook disaster right now <laughs> where everything is so div divisive. Um, but just know the intent is, is your safety and the safety of people's employees. So being supportive of things like that, I think will be huge um, as we come out of um, the state that we're in right now. That's, I, I, I would wholeheartedly appreciate having the same procedure at every restaurant because yeah. um, I'm finding myself having to call when I get there and say, okay, what I'm supposed to do here. Yeah. So, um, and that can't be efficient. So, um, all right, I think we're going to do a round robin on, on, on a sort of a final question here. I'd like to hear from each of you, um, what worries you most as you look towards the summer and what gives you the most hope uh, that, that things are going to be moving back in the right direction? So what worries you the most, what gives you the most hope? And I'll start with Jim. Uh, boy, great question, Paul. I think what worries me and maybe gives me the most hope is demand. So there will be demand for beer, there will be demand for uh, food, there will be demand for cars, there will be uh, demand for furniture, and so that all bodes well for West Michigan. How it plays out, how we, does the supply chain support it? Does the supply chain support providing that and covering that demand? I think that's the interesting thing. We were at 17 million units this month. We were at 13, or last month at 13 million units. Estimates at 15 million units. What does that mean as far as light vehicles for produced in Michigan and the supply chains and the workers that buy beer? Um, I, I think it's, it's, gosh, to quote, you know, Dickens, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, and we'll see where we go. Okay. Um, Dave? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, count the ways of the worries, right? It's hard to <laughs> prioritize the list of worries in some degree, uh, just given this, the state of things and just the uncertainty. I think, but really, uh, the piece that I'm most worried about is just the, the reopening, for whatever reason, regardless of how measured or, or quick it is, you know, regardless, it just, that whatever the result is, it increases, or, you know, you see a resurgence in, in cases and that the public health crisis comes back and that we were back in that crisis response mode. Uh, that is absolutely what I'm most worried about because I, I, I'm terrified of a you know, business le community, business leaders, anybody in the space needs certainty and the uncertainty of when they can operate and when they can't operate. And if the government starts turning on, things on and off, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very worried about that reality. So I'm really, but I'm also hopeful that, um, you know, it's amazing how much people have responded to the adherence to social distancing and kind of been flexible into Chris's point, like, no, like this is best intentions, I think. Um, gener you know, everyone's got different opinions on, on a lot of ways and how the tactics and things, but it is amazing, I think, uh, and I'm very hopeful in the spirit in, in our region and in our, in our people that uh, they'll continue to collaborate and, and work towards, um, you know, reopening in a, in a way that allows people to start re accessing prosperity and, and quality jobs again. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the two things for me. Excellent. Thank you. Chris? I think Dave took mine. <laughs> I think the worry is definitely that uncertainty. Um, just, it, you feel like, I feel like a ball in a pinball game, right? We're just being like shot in every direction. And just when you think you know something, the rules change. Um, so the continuation of that into the foreseeable future uh, is definitely worrisome. Uh, I also worry about you know, what is the landscape for my industry going to look like um, in this region and in this state? I haven't heard of anybody um, as far as breweries that aren't going to make it yet. No one's made that, that claim or put that stake in the ground. Um, I have heard, you know, rumors of different restaurants that aren't going to make it. And 
and, and that is just sad. Um, you know, I think we have such a great community that if it, we come out of this looking very different, you know, that'll, I think that'll take an emotional toll on a lot of us, whether we're in the industry or not. Um, you know, the optimism, I mean, seriously, this sunny day makes me <laughs> more optimistic, just going into warmer weather. And I think that naturally brings a different state of mind and a, a different openness of our minds. So, you know, I'm hopeful that, um, I'm optimistic, I suppose, that we'll get through this and we'll be stronger in the end, even if we're smaller or different. Um, I, I look forward to that day when I can look back and say, oh, look at all the great things we learned. <laughs> but I'm not sure when that day will come. Hopefully sooner than later. So, yeah, I think... Uh, I think as we as we wait for uh, Diana to come back in and and put a period on on all of this, uh, as I look at it from my seat, we're most worried about about the virus coming back. One of the hardest things about this as an economist is that economic models are telling me nothing right now. Um, what I what I have to look at is epidemiological models, and I can barely pronounce it. Uh, uh, so it's, that's what's going to choose when we get to reopen. And as business people, we're used to having more control than that. Um, there's, there's very little control of it and we have to wait. So, uh, Diana. Thanks. Paul, thank you for moderating. This was a really interesting discussion. Uh, Jim, Dave, and Chris, your perspectives came from very different directions, but all focused on the economy and what we need to do to move forward. So we appreciate the time and your experience and insight that you provided for us. Uh, the economy as the underlying, I think, takeaway from all of this is uncertainty. And we have to learn how to live with uncertainty for a bit longer, probably a month or two months, probably way beyond that. But in the end, we will be a stronger community and stronger industries because we will have learned a lot from this. So thank you all very much for tuning in and uh, zooming in, I should say, into this webinar. I hope that, that the listeners found this to be valuable and, and helpful to think through your immediate, your medium term, term and your long term decisions that you have to make for yourself, your employees, your families, and everyone else that you interact with. So don't forget the 10, 10, 10. We have to look at what we're doing today because we have to keep people safe and as many people employed and supportive and supporting them as possible. At the same time, we have to look at what we are going to leave for our children, our grandchildren, and people who will be following us in these leadership roles. So, uh, Good luck with every, to everyone in all that you are having to deal with. Uh, our, next, our next webinar is two weeks from today, and the topic is a bit different. It's avoiding bankruptcy. So hopefully we will have some of you tuning in again. Thank you all, panelists. Thank you so much, Paul, for moderating this. And everyone, have a good afternoon. Bye.